So I've chosen to use just a light a white wine vinegar. Freshness, the essence of food. That's up next on Chef Sophia, where in this episode, we travel to Portland, Oregon to cook with Corey Schreiber of Wildwood Restaurant. Cooking from the source is his mantra, and his native Oregon the inspiration. After years of culinary adventures around the world, he came home, as he likes to say, like a salmon returning to its native waters. His cooking is sincere, and his accolades too long to mention. A James Beard Award winner, as well as a top pick in most major food and wine publications, Corey emphasizes organic produce from the Pacific Northwest, prepared in ways that allow the natural beauty and flavors of the ingredients to shine forth, unobstructed by fussy embellishments. But first, it's out to West Union Gardens, where farmer Jeff Bowden has reinvigorated the soil, brought it closer to nature, and explains to Chef Corey the grower's magic. You have that on your table, and people go, what is that? I mean, it's not an onion, obviously. It is sunrise. Do you know where your farmer is? My land needs to be better this year than it was last year. Could you find a farm or a farmer if you had to? Chances are your grandmother and grandfather lived on or near somebody's farm. Pull this guy up. Jeff Bowden in his fields in Oregon is so cultivating old standards with a modern twist, it's rooted in sustainability, good. the environment, and yes, taste. We cherish these farmlands that are really close to the city. Farmer and chef are having a meeting, <laughs> not in a cubicle, not with chemists or accountants. They're having a meeting with freshness. This place has very, very heavy soil, and we uh, do a, use a lot of leaf compost each year. On the agenda at this meeting, naturalness, true organic growing, <laughs> taste. I wanted to be able, at the end of the day, to take any product that I have in my field and put it on my own dinner table. And you know, I think that some of the guys, you know, conventional growers would have a hard time actually doing that. And there's a huge ratification in that. Well, let's go and look at some other plants. Go into the fields with the farmer and make sure you bring along your nose. I think one of the important things for a person when they come out to the farm, you know, here's the berries. You can smell the berry. As the day warms up, you can smell it more. You know, on a hot day, it actually smells like a cobbler out here. When you can smell it and you can see, you know, hey, here's the little berry and the middle-sized berry, a nice, the nice plump one that's ready to eat. And then, you know, you can say, well, I don't know, I don't know what a waldo berry is or a Miriam berry or, or a boysenberry or a raspberry. So they, hmm, well, that's okay. And they can go over and try this one here. And then, uh, you know, that's an experience. That's something that occurred to me when I opened Wildwood about seven years ago and I came back mainly here in Oregon where it really kind of all of a sudden registered that I would go out and ask somebody how their meal was and they would say, gosh, you know, the berry cobbler was really good. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, they said the berry was really good. I mean, certainly there was preparation and then our pastry chef got involved and there was a dough. <laughs> but I heard that over and over. It was, the, hey, the zucchini was really good. The beans were really good. And they were always pointing at the product. And then all of a sudden, of course, I, I didn't always know that as a chef. But I think here in Oregon, I've become more and more aware of how people are so attached to the product, where the product comes from, the quality of the product, and knowing about that it has been picked and delivered within a day or two period. And that makes all the difference uh, in the world, really, when it comes to cooking or not even cooking. Because I think out here, is, like you say, it smells like a cobbler. <laughs> yeah. That's where the idea comes from, and it's yeah. really, it really does happen uh, in the field. The uh, sylvan blackberries, I think, would be great in a salad. These are the kind that we toss with a little bit of, little bit of onion, maybe a cheese crouton. That these toss together and just create their own. You can almost see it's coming off my hand right there. <laughs> no, these are actually they make a great vinaigrette. Yeah. I take them and I just smash <laughs> them up a little bit with a little bit of vanilla and some shallot, and maybe a little bit of thyme, and then they just become their own vinaigrette. Yeah, it's just true. a touch of uh, orange juice and maybe no vinegar actually. So the fruit and the acidity, mm, it's right there. Oh, That's no. the best part. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just grow them. And you don't just go out and pick them either. There is a technique to the picking. It is very important to know when to pick. 
Well, sometimes, like with, the, with these, with the, with the blackberries, the, the whole key is the berry has to be black. And so you have a, a new picker, or you just need to remind someone. You go to the flat and you say, you pick one out that's obviously not. So, you know, you have ones here, this is too red, but, you know, you have ones that are, this one here is still, it's just, it's not right. There's still a little bit of red. You just pick that out and say, here, you eat this one. And they'll eat it and they'll go, oh, sour. I says, don't pick it. See, that's the same trick in the field as we use in the kitchen, actually, too, because we'll do the same thing if we make a vinaigrette, say, with berries in it, and then we'll just pick that one out or spoon one out, and they'll taste it and say, is it off? Is it the way you want it to be? And they go, no, no, this is not right. And so it answers itself, as I say, <laughs> yeah. and then it's clear. Take that one out, make sure that we pick the ingredient carefully, place it, and really taste it is the key. Well, you, you do keep the farm. You do keep the, you do keep the land. I mean, to me, that's the emphasis. The challenge for Jeff was to grow something that his French counterpart was producing and beat the price right here in the USA. These are some shallots that I were growing this year, Corey. And the, uh, the nice thing with these is that they are growing from seed. We used to always grow them like the French shallots from the sets. And it seemed like uh, we couldn't make any money because you could, they could air freight them from France cheaper than I could grow them here. So we had to find some way cheaper to, 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 to grow them. And we start these in the, in the greenhouse in uh, boxes in January and set them out in usually early April. And this is how big they get already. Uh, this is July, and they're looking really nice. Here's an example. We'll just pull this guy up. And... Look how huge they are. I think you've beat the French on this one already. <laughs> You know, that's true. I mean, I notice here in Oregon when I go in the markets, uh, in anything in this family, whether it's the onions, the walla wallas, whether it's the leeks, uh, even the garlic that I've seen around here, it's something about the soil and the climate of how they get so large. Because if you were to show this to any other chef and anywhere in the United States, they would not believe that this <laughs> is a shallot. And it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit softer to it and has a nice red color, but it's just amazing in its size. It's just beautiful. I do a lot of work to make the soil as good as it is. Uh, this, this place has very, very heavy soil, and we uh, do a, use a lot of leaf compost each year, uh, many tons. And we, sh we just manure spread it on the field, work it in the ground, and as we've done this for about eight, nine years now, um, the, the ability of, for, the, for the plant to grow healthily and also the, the, the retention of the water in the ground, um, it's just the plants are growing good. You know, recipe-wise, something like this, it's always a question of, um, you know, do I eat it raw, do I, do I cook it? And then always the question of, is this milder than an onion? Is it more tart? Does it have more sulfur than an onion? And it goes on and on. There, usually it's said that people say shallots are a little bit on the mild side, but it really depends on the varietal. And that's the thing that I'm learning to break down as a chef here in Oregon is that I really have to pay attention to the varietals because they're all different. So if you ever have this, this is an atlas yep. variety. This atlas or ambition, that's the two varieties. And I So you have two varieties of shallots and they're yeah. probably uh, distinctly different in a way. Yep. Like water content, sulfur yep. content, sharpness, you know, so do you eat it raw, do you cook it? So I really pay attention to that. So looking at something like this, what we do in the restaurant is where we use most of our shallots is in a wood roasted mussel dish. So it goes in with shallots and garlic and a little bit of saffron oil, chardonnay wine vinegar and roast the mussel next to the wood fire uh, using a lot of the shallots. When you are standing out in the field and looking at your crop, how do you measure success? By paying attention to the taste buds? So what I have here is my zucchini field. I have twice too many more plants than I need, but that's the only way to have enough zucchini at the beginning of the season. So as the season goes, like what we do is we, last week we abandoned two rows. And what we'll do is, We'll come through and we'll cut those plants off, put them in the compost pile, and we'll come back in about three days and we'll plant new young plants in those places. Because going into the fall, uh, a younger zucchini plant can weather temperature way better than one of these mature ones that's already had 25 zucchinis taken off of it. I love the way that you guys get them right at the right size, like that one yeah, over there. I'll show you some right here. So here we have a the yellow one, we just break the flower off. That's about the right size. You know, when you first touch them, they almost have that kind of, you want to pet them almost. You know, they have <laughs> almost that fur on them a little bit. That's and right. they are, and that, that smell, and that to me is this, the epitome of like yep. garden That's smell. It. And everybody loves that color. Not much difference between the inside of the yellow one or the green one. Right. But it's a great vehicle for you guys in the market it's to color. sell these. That's it's right. color, it's great yeah. color. But these are, um, you know, they're high water content. 
And I just remember, you know, we've gotten away from stewing these for a long time and making them really soft. They're really quite good that way. Yes. That's yeah. what the problem with people when they, they blanch them. I mean, that's the worst way to oh, do it. Oh, it is. Put them back in water. No, they need to be cooked in their own water. So I think they're about 80% water. And, and then they are just, uh, they're fantastic. And like you say, there's an abundance of them. There's an abundance of varieties. Like, you've got a green one over there also. Oh, there's some tiny ones, too. Yep. The whole family's here. The whole family's here. The mama, the papa. Here, here. Wow. Yeah, so that's about how you like them. That's, that's how about we, the that's, ideal that's size. That's about the ideal size. Take the top off of there. Yep. But some of these younger ones, you know, that's the flower. Yep. And this is one thing the chefs don't seem to get enough of, is this uh, flowering top. We take this and stuff this with a little bit of breadcrumb or some cheese, uh, maybe some type of seafood mousse, and then it gets either baked, but I love to just do a little bit of a, a batter, like a cornmeal batter or a tempura batter and deep fry those. Mm -hmm. And a three of those as an appetizer is just great, but they don't see many of these. Do you usually use zucchini or just any, old, any squash? Any squash blossom like that yeah. is great. But this is the real, the real product here. These, just uh, a little bit of sweet onion or some of the shallot that we found over yep. there. Uh, maybe a little bit of tomato stewed down and it's a great base for a piece of fish or a piece of meat. So, beautiful stuff. And fields of it too. <laughs> okay, we're off. How do we, how should we think about freshness? In North America, the 20th century was devoted to packaging, marketing, processing, boxes and cans and shipping, breeding square tomatoes to fit square containers. Great shipping, not so great taste. It's, it's one of the hardest things to understand in terms of uh, the key to getting things fresh and the key to getting things simple. People like myself are, are trained in very complicated cuisines, uh, we're trained in uh, methods that have been used for over 100 years, and you're really thinking about technique, 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 and you're thinking about just, just getting the food from whatever source, whatever large source it comes from. And you remember, uh, like an apprentice, you're always grabbing all these dried herbs, and you're grabbing artificial thickeners, and you don't think about it so much when you're trained. And then it's almost like you have to take many steps back and almost think like a farmer, or think like a peasant, or think in a very simplistic mode, and then this appreciation comes up for all this product, and that's not an easy transformation. When you're out there in the field as we were yesterday, I noticed when I picked the zucchini, for example, there's that light, almost that hairline over the zucchini, and it's kind of funny, when the produce comes into the restaurant, you're still kind of looking for that fresh pick quality that you had when I touched the zucchini, or when I see the garlic fresh before it even dries, and I notice that, that pin, the skin just peels off. I mean, you're, I'm always kind of referring back to the original uh, form of the ingredient. And always trying to remember, you know, what is the garlic like and the garlic like in its original whole form? What was the zucchini like when it came right out of the garden? And that becomes the inspiration for what shouldn't I do to it, as opposed to what can I do to transform it into something else. With the zucchini, we know this is about a day out of the garden. Uh, I don't like to get involved in real fancy uh, cuts with that. I just go straight across. It's got a great natural shape. You just have to be thinking about how long you want to cook it. So I'm going to cut it just a little bit thicker because I want to stew this actually so it's a little bit soft. I don't need it to be crunchy. I want to benefit from some of the great, uh, as he was saying, they have a large water content in the zucchini. So I'm going to take advantage of that and cook it in its own juice, if you will. Something like this. Uh, again, I have the Walla Walla onions are in season. We're going to mince a little bit of the onion. Doesn't have to be a real fine cut. If you wanted to just cut it uh, straight across and leave it that way, that'd be fine too. I'm not even gonna go back over this again. Both these ingredients, uh, again, have been transported a lot. As you see, the, fa the farms are closed, so I know the water content is, is great on these. So you'll see that when I put it in the pan. However, I will use uh, just a little bit of butter in the pan. Let that melt just for a second. And this particular dish is finished with just a little bit of chopped thyme. So really, I'm only dealing with four ingredients here. I've got butter, I've got a zucchini, yellow, green, or both. I've got onion, and I'm going to finish with a little bit of chopped thyme. So that's kind of rounding it out. But the key here is the timing and, and checking to see how much water is in the uh, zucchini. This is a dish that uh, actually can go by itself, or I'm going to do it with a little bit of salmon. So this is sautéed summer squash with uh, Walla Walla onions, a little bit of thyme. And then we're going to grill a piece of salmon, this wild king salmon off the Oregon coast, and just set that on top of it. And again, very simple. I'm not adding a starch or a potato or a rice, just really relying uh, on those uh, simple ingredients. Uh, the onions soften pretty quickly. And then 
The zucchini can go on the pan. I put a little bit of salt in there to help extract some of that water out and uh, a little bit of pepper. And we let that cook very slowly uh, over the flame. This is the wild salmon, firm fleshed, uh, beautiful salmon right before it comes up river and the, the numerous water outlets on the Oregon coast. Uh, the salmon is still swimming off the coast. It's got a really healthy diet from the waters and it's firm and the color is beautiful and the oil, ten, oil content on it is, is great also. So again, we're treating it very simply. We're a little bit of salt, uh, a little bit of pepper on both sides. And then we're going to rub it with a little bit of olive oil. And I'm just going to slowly grill this uh, right behind me on the grill right here. We'll let that cook kind of slowly. Now with the salad, we blanched off the beans. Uh, we have boysenberries, raspberries, uh, sylvan berries. Uh, the other item that we took from the field uh, yesterday was the shallot. And the thing that impressed me most about this, and I almost couldn't believe, it's like the garlic, uh, it's so large. I mean, it's just absolutely uh, probably twice the size of what we normally see as a French shallot. So uh, the shallots uh, is fresh out of the field. Uh, I thought in this particular incidence that these were so big that I could actually grill them and add them to a salad. Normally I would use a walla walla onion, I'd use a red onion, uh, something of that nature that might have a little bit of sugar to it. So this is an unusual approach, but again, it's inspired by the fact that this product is so unusual, gives me another idea, something to do with a shallot that I really have not done in, in the past. So uh, this can be actually just baked in the oven or it can be actually grilled. Uh, when I look at this, I see an amazing grain pattern inside of the, uh, inside of the shallot. Incredible grain, very loose. I ex actually ate a little bit of this raw and found that it was mild enough that it would benefit from just a light uh, grilling procedure. So again, back to my salt, a little bit of pepper. I'm going to baste these with a little bit of oil and put them on the grill also. So the shallots are on the grill. This is a salad that we'd run on the restaurant. Again, we're trying to layer flavors up here. We know we have the berries, we have the beans, now we have the shallot. It uh, comes to mind maybe a little bit of cheese will be used on the salad. So I'm gonna, we're gonna bake a little bit of uh, sheep's milk cheese for the salad. Nice green mix here. This is a woman who actually has a garden about uh, seven miles from the restaurant. It's actually in an urban area. It's in a suburban area, and she has plotted off about two acres, and she has a mix of about 22 varieties of lettuce in her mix, and uh, some of them are heirloom varieties. They're not all actually lettuce varieties. You'll find some tarragon in here, some basil in here, some chervil in here, and then you'll find some very old varieties of lettuce and miner's lettuce and things like that. So we use this in the restaurant. Uh, this is an example where we were talking about how he picks all these so perfectly ripe that I, I know for sure when I grab each one of these berries, even though I have probably 100 berries here, that every time I grab one, I know that they were picked at the height of ripeness, so I'm not double checking and tasting as I go. I have some insurance built into it. I know all these berries work. So raspberries, uh, boysenberries, uh, sylvan berries. We're going to throw a little bit of the shallot in there to go with it. The uh, mixture of yellow and green beans in the salad also. In this particular case, I, I want a vinaigrette that's not going to uh, compete, if you will, with the berries so much. Uh, red wine makes me think of competition with the berries, so I have a little bit whiter uh, champagne uh, vinaigrette made with olive oil and grapeseed oil, a little bit of salt and pepper. Because in a way, the berries, as I toss them in my hands, they begin to crumble, they begin to fall apart. That's part of the salad, and they become part of the dressing. Some of that natural berry juice kind of leaks out. So again, uh, Mother Nature seems to be helping me out a little bit as I'm cooking and giving me some nice uh, impart of uh, flavor on there. So in this case, we just put the, the cheese on top, and once we cut into that, we'll see how the cheese just melts out uh, over the top of the salad and creates almost a secondary uh, dressing to it, if you will. Now with the zucchini, 
Um, this is al it almost becomes translucent, if you will. You can see it's still a little bit hot. Uh, the onion has been cooked down. Again, using fresh herbs. I've got fresh chopped thyme here. That's the only accent I'm going to uh, use for this uh, zucchini, and just toss that in at the end. And I might even just squish it up a little bit too, because as you can see, this is a very simple plate again. There's, there's the squash on the plate, the salmon on top. Uh, there's no potato, there's no rice, there's no starch. So I'm really relying on the zucchini to be full flavored, uh, to have plenty of texture on there. And uh, this is almost done in an old fashioned style. You can see it almost lets some of its flesh out, some of that seed in the middle. It's something Jeff was talking about yesterday, not letting the zucchini get too big, because then you have all that seed in there. This has a nice amount of flesh that I'm kind of utilizing. I don't want to say as a sauce so much on the plate, but it is a textural addition to the plate. So I didn't even put that back on again with the thyme in there. I'm just going to let the thyme be almost a perfume element uh, to this as it goes down on the plate. And that's a very, uh, you look at this and it's a very simplistic dish and something you might do is you just, you, you have a little bit of butter in the zucchini, but I might just take a little bit of this olive oil and put that on top or possibly squeeze a little bit of uh, lemon juice on top of this too. And you'd look at this and say, it's a nice, it's a nice lunch item, but that's, it's plenty to eat. And again, you, it's all done uh, right there without cooking too much. What we did here today with the food in terms of preparing it right in front of you, it's a sensibility about shopping. I would almost spend more time picking out the ingredients, talking to the farmers, and worrying less about the technique. With the restaurant, one thing that I always accredit the restaurant as an identity for in terms of what does all this come down to and why do we go through this seven days a week, lunch and dinner, and feed 2,000 people one by one through the course of a week, what I've found is it comes down to the relationships. It comes down to the relationships with the farmers and how we adapt and work with them and become knowledgeable about the, their processes and their hardships uh, and their triumphs in the field. I think it has to be a process that's constantly evolving, and that's something that we're seeing as we connect with farmers and we build extensions outside of the restaurant. It forces me to uh, always be looking, always be shaping. And I feel that if I had a philosophy of cooking that was just rooted in classical cooking, then I would just stay there. So the philosophy in cooking is certainly uh, based on freshness, uh, based on farmer connections, uh, based on seasonality, uh, based on exquisite ingredients that you know we're sourcing very carefully and knowing where they come from. And then, of course, just what I call sensibilities. They're cooking sensibilities, or what I was told as a young apprentice, common sense comes into play and applying to simple techniques that allow for the product to speak uh, for itself. For Farmer Jeff and Chef Corey, success is measured in connections. The farmer and nature. The chef and the customer. Field and kitchen. Freshness and taste.